Okay, right. this is Ben's small biography. <laughs> so Ben's a biologist by training, but he, uh, having a PhD from the University of Maryland, or Maryland in Baltimore, um, did a postdoc with Eugene Koonin and became intensely interested in data science education and started a large number of bioinformatics and coding classes, which eventually became the bioinformatics and data science department um, for advanced education in the sciences. And this department now teaches 22 graduate level courses a year, mostly to postdocs and, ooh, there we go, sorry, mostly to postdocs and NIH, on the NIH campus. Um, ben, so um, ben, is, <laughs> ben is thrilled to be turning over the management of this department to three young energetic individuals this summer which I believe is like now, right? He's done. Yeah, so yeah, we're really lucky to get him here now because he just moved house to Pittsburgh four days ago. So he, he left his family amongst the boxes and came over so he could talk to us today. So, um, and I met Ben at a, a hackathon. So Ben uh, organizes hackathons around the country, um, which I would call a nerdathon, but he might get upset. <laughs> no, it's really it's a really cool way to actually get um, bioinformatics folks together with biologists and get together and produce some uh, really cool new prototype software to solve biological problems. And that's why I met Ben. I've been to a couple of hackathons with him, and now we uh, collaborate on projects. So, um, Ben. All right, so I have a couple of objectives here. And, and the big thing that I want to do is I want to tell you about the future of bioinformatics. And, and the reason that maybe I know something about the future of bioinformatics is because a lot of what I do is go around the country and work with amazingly talented graduate students, postdocs, and assistant professors on prototyping bioinformatics tools that really sort of push the envelope of bioinformatics. Um, also, hopefully this talk is fun for you. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, a lot about cool, fun things. And then uh, if you want to know about how to do this stuff with NCBI tools, come tomorrow morning. Yeah? Everybody good with that? So if anybody is having a less good time, say 20 minutes from now, than when they walked in the room, please let me know and we'll change something. Yeah? All right. Fantastic. All right. Good. So uh, I work at a place called NCBI. So NCBI houses all the biomedical literature in the world, uh, which uh, the medical students in here will use quite a bit. Um, and we also have a number of health resources. I'm going to talk about these tomorrow. But uh, these have things like annotated variants. And as a clinician, in five, 10 years from now, you will almost certainly have patients showing up with personal genetic data asking you what variants mean. Uh, when we get a little further on, I'll talk about how we're now going beyond variants, and people will probably be asking you what haplotypes mean. Um, finally, we're the largest genomic database in the world. Uh, so we have about 14 petabytes of genomic data. That's about 4 million data sets. Um, so lots and lots of data. Uh, we also know some things about genes. Uh, and uh, we have something called PubChem, uh, which may be useful to you. So I want to talk a little bit about literature in case the rest of the talk is completely useless to you. At least you might have gotten lunch. And hopefully um, you'll use PubMed enough that you get your hour back. Uh, I'm a really big proponent of not wasting time. So uh, I'd just like to remind people that there are several ways to get to literature. Um, so, and I will show you. Um, so one is obviously through the PubMed and PMC websites. And I like to remind people that they can do advanced searches, but they can also create alerts through my NCBI account. So if there's something you want to search for regularly, uh, you can have PubMed crawl the web for you. So that's kind of a nice thing. We also have an API uh, if you want to go faster uh, and bigger with your searches. And this 
Uh, we have something called eDirect now, which is a command line implementation for this API. And uh, if you Google for eDirect cookbook, you can get uh, lots of uh, little cheat sheets uh, to go and uh, look for things in the API. So this was an experiment we did. We said, well, if we just put API calls on the web, will people use them? And the answer apparently is yes. Uh, so that's a nice thing. Uh, you can also cache all of PubMed uh, on a local system if you want to do more complex calls. Although now uh, with PubMed Labs, you can do complex calls right on the NCBI website. Um, and you can also uh, grab the open access subset of PMC uh, and uh, PubMed uh, if you want. And by the way, uh, if, you, if the whole medical school thing doesn't work out, if you learn how to do natural language processing, you will have a job immediately. Uh, pretty much everybody is looking to hire NLP people. Um, we also, so speaking of NLP, uh, there's a lot of people that do EMR or electronic medical record mining. And uh, uh, really, we ask them how their NLP tools are. And they say, well, they're only as good as the uh, corpus is updated. So uh, we built this prototype called PubRunner, which automatically updates the PubMed Central corpus for natural language processing tools. Um, I imagine for clinicians, um, and this is my personal opinion, uh, as is everything else I say today, uh, I imagine for clinicians that mining through uh, large uh, corpi or large sets of electronic medical records will be a big part of uh, the next 10 years. Uh, if you want to learn more about this type of stuff, uh, check out ncbi.nlm.nih.gov slash learn. Uh, we do a webinar pretty much every week on some topic. So uh, if you want to get more information, that's a great resource. So uh, if you're not a bioinformatician, I'd like to go through next generation sequencing uh, in about 90 seconds. So this is an Illumina sequencer. It generates short read. Uh, data and we usually either uh, map it to a reference genome and call variants or look at expression or we assemble it de novo. Yeah? Um, and now we have sort of third generation sequencing with long reads. Everybody understand? Anybody not understand? Fantastic. All right, great. So uh, that's next generation sequencing and at NCBI we host things. Uh, one of the ways you can find things is in terms of bio projects. I made this slide a couple of years ago. If you search for tuberculosis, you can find pretty much any data type you want. And if you're interested particularly in something like RNA-seq, you might look at SRA and transcriptome. That would give you raw RNA-seq data, yeah? Um, but what's most important when thinking about public data sets is metadata. Um, and if you're involved in data generation at all, please remember that regularized metadata is what makes data searchable. I have people that talk to me about machine learning every day, but I like to remind them that without sufficient metadata, you really can't do machine learning because you don't have enough data sets to compare. So uh, that's a big deal. And uh, this is something I love to talk about. So if there's time at the end uh, or later today or whatever, I'm always happy to talk about metadata and some of the collaborative work that we're doing uh, to work on metadata. I'll tell you a little bit about it later. Um, we have labels that can be used for metadata. So here's some data, and the metadata isn't horrible. That's nice. But what if the metadata is insufficient? So one thing we've done is we've taxonomically indexed everything in the sequence read archive. So that 14 petabytes of data I told you about, we're able to uh, index that based on taxonomy. I suspect we'll be taking all the human reads and indexing them by variants and then eventually haplotypes. And that's exciting because, and I'll talk about this several times, if we had an index of human haplotypes, we can start putting patients into bins. What that is called is precision medicine. And that is where we are hoping to go. Um, so all of it is taxonomically indexed. Um, and, and this is the best educational demo I've ever done in my life. So I was at the City University of New York. And I was teaching a bunch of undergrads how to use this. In fact, we did an experiment. We had undergrads go through the SRA and search for viruses. And we gave the 
Deloitte actually, gave the best project uh, $5,000 towards their tuition for the next semester at San Diego State and City University of New York. Anyway, I'm teaching uh, how to do this, and I said, somebody pick a virus. And they said, well, what about human herpes virus? And I said, OK. So we searched for it in the SRA. And I went and checked all the metagenomes. So there's, there's a bunch of different metagenomes there. And we picked a sample, and it was dollar bills in New York City that had been swabbed, and they sequenced the metagenome. And I said, of course, that's an artifact. That's, there's not really herpes on dollar bills in New York City. And then so we did a blast search. So this is a blast search. And here you see the length of the herpes virus. And you see almost all of herpes virus 1 is on dollar bills in New York City. And I'm, I'm not saying, by the way, that you're going to get herpes from dollar bills in New York City. But I do wash my hands a little bit more uh, after doing that demo. That's, that's kind of uh, scary a little bit to me. So, so speaking of blasting, say you want to extract the data. Now we have, uh, we have tools like Magic Blast, where you can just come from this uh, uh, next generation sequencing data and blast. So uh, let me show you how you do this, right? So you just download a binary. Now I need something to blast into, right? So say I'm interested in, I don't know, bovine mastitis, right? So it's where you have E. coli and it's infecting um, uh, the, the cow, right? And so here, maybe I'm interested in quorum sensing bacteria. Everybody know what quorum sensing is? Can you infer from context? Yes? All right, good. All right, so say I'm interested in quorum sensing in these infectious bacteria, right? So I can look at a paper. And uh, here, LSRR is interested in quorum, is involved in quorum sensing. So this is where I go really fast. But all these slides are online. So if you're actually interested, you can go and look them up and go back through them. So this is bioinformatics in 10 minutes. All right, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for LSRR and E. coli. I see lots of stuff, and I'm going to search in gene, right? So NCBI gene, if you're just getting started with bioinformatics, is sort of like uh, a good place to start. Uh, if, especially if you're interested in things at a gene level. Here I see LSRR. That's great. <coughs> Here I can look at it in the genomic context, and it looks like this. There's a protein, so on and so forth. I can right click on that. Um, I can look at a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I can also send it to BLAST, right? So that's great. So I can BLAST the protein. I send it to BLAST. And here what I'm going to do is here I've looked at it in a relatively quiescent uh, strain of bacteria, uh, MG1655. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this, but you could probably eat this strain of bacteria, E. coli and you'd be OK. And I'm comparing it to another strain of E. coli called Sakai. And Sakai uh, made a lot of Japanese school children sick about a decade ago. And it's a really, really nasty bug. And what I want to see is LSRR different in the Sakai versus the uh, MG1655, and it's not. Right? So then what I probably need to look at, if this bacteria is involved in quorum sensing, is expression. Right? So how do I do that? Well, I can go and I can look for RNA-seq data. So that's RNA-seq data of Escherichia uh, that is infecting uh, Bostaurus uh, in this mastitis protocol. And uh, so here I can look. I can get a sequence for that gene. Here's the sequence. and here is where I go onto the command line. Now, many of you are saying, I don't know anything about command line. I don't know how to use the command line. I'm going to be a physician. Still, uh, just as backup, uh, I would suggest learning Linux. It will take you less than two days. And check out software carpentry. The, if you spend four hours with software carpentry, you'll be able to do all this after four hours. I am not joking. Uh, so basically, you untar it, then you make a BLAST database. And then you blast into it. And here are some of the more specific commands. But here's the really cool part. I realized I was making this demo, and I was realizing that I really lived in the 21st century. Because what are we doing here? We're taking raw reads out of a massive database, a huge data center, and comparing it to one specific sequence. And I'm able to do this on a plane. Uh, so that's very exciting to me. By the way. You can't use FTP on a plane for a variety of reasons. But HTTP, you totally can. So, so you can now 
stream data on a plane. And that's, that's very exciting to me. And you get a BAM file, so, or a SAM file, really. Uh, you can do similar searches on the web. Uh, here I've taken human endogenous retrovirus Herb K and blasted it into a lady known as NA12878. NA12878 is a woman in Utah. I have no idea what her real name is, but she's been sequenced about 2,600 times. In fact, she is the first uh, human genome standard reference uh, in NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Interestingly enough, uh, so other parts of my group, I think I have a, some slides on this later, are interested in uh, expression of uh, endogenous retroviruses in cancer. And we see expression of HERV-K in some cancer types. And uh, that's, that's something that I think is particularly neat. And it seems uh, there is some literature that suggests that expression of endogenous retroviruses makes patients uh, more responsive to immunotherapy. And that is why uh, I think this might be quite important. Uh, so yeah, Magic Blast works uh, with some other software. Um, you can stream, you can get any software to stream data. This is really for the bioinformaticians in the room. Um, here's how you get more information. Uh, and uh, you don't care about this. I'm going to skip it. All right. Um, so now um, that's my uh, sort of the boring part of the talk. And now I'm really going to go off the rails and tell you about the future of bioinformatics. So now what we can do with things like Magic Blast is we can call SNPs on the fly. So remember I showed you before, we had to take these whole genomes and align them and then call variants. There's a stepwise process. It's really big. Now I can just say, here's a variant. Is it in there? Well, why do I care about that? Well, I tell you, you know, uh, something that I didn't know until recently uh, the CFTR, we always think that's just important in cystic fibrosis, right? But in fact, the CFTR is very important in patients uh, with pancreatitis. Uh, it turns out that CFTR carriers uh, actually have some pancreatic phenotypes. And so what if, uh, oh, by the way, these are the people that built that. Uh, what if there was a pulmonology department uh, next door uh, to a pancreas department and you wanted to see if they had any patients you were interested in. Well, what you could do is send them a robot where all, all you had to do is say, are these SNPs in some of my patients? And they can go ahead and look without transferring any data anywhere. So privacy concerns are really allayed. And then if they have patients you're interested in, then you can set up some sort of collaboration or something. So, uh, and this is just a prototype called genomic robots. In my lab, we use this uh, for looking at complex genotype phenotype associations. Um, and now we can call variants uh, not only out of DNA, but out of RNA. And, and the reason that this is important is because RNA-seq is super cheap. You know, we talked about, you know, people talk about the, uh, the $1,000 human genome, which is now more or less a reality. But right now, I can go get somebody's RNA-seq for $200 and then get expression and variants. And, and this is actually a protocol for single cell RNA-seq. So I can look at specific cells, call variants out of them uh, with RNA-seq. And so that's, that's a very exciting thing. And we built this in a couple of hackathons. So uh, that was a nice thing. We also have this thing called FENVAR. So uh, when your patients come to you and they show up and they have their super duper 23 and me done and they say, what does this variant do? you will say, I have no idea. And ClinVar doesn't have any idea because it hasn't been uh, submitted by the clinical genetics community. But here, you can put in an RSID. That's just an accession number for human variants. And here, if I look at this one, 6003, I can see that uh, I can see all of the terms co-mentioned in PubMed with that particular variant. So that's kind of cool, right? But my friends, they like to make fun, and they say, but Ben, word clouds aren't science, right? This is just a word cloud. It's just for fun. But check this out. Here are D3 graphs underneath. So this variant in the middle, that's R6003. Around it are a bunch of PubMed abstracts. And here are other variants cited by them. And this is why, if you're in bioinformatics, be very careful of GWAS studies, because all of these are GWAS studies. And you can see that the variants aren't overlapping a whole hell of a lot, right? But there are variants, variants like this one, which is RS800292. Uh, I do this too much. 
Uh, but anyway, so this is thought to be a benign variant. But check this out. If you, if you look, actually you make a graph of RS-800-292, uh, you can see that it's really at the center of a lot of human disease, right? Like, I mean, it's really quite central to age-related macular degeneration. And so this is why, in my personal opinion, we need to really start thinking about haplotypes instead of individual variants. And there's hope. So uh, the new human genome, uh, GRCH39, was scheduled to come out in about a year and a half. And they've, they've delayed the release of that human genome to look at graphs. And it's pretty likely that the next human genome that is released will not be one human genome. It'll be 150,000 human genomes. Uh, all in a graph together. And the reason that's amazing is because then I can take some low coverage from 23andMe or something, and I can say, you, as a patient, go in this block, and we know that these drugs are effective for patients like you. And that is precision medicine, and that is something I think that we should be very excited about. Um, another thing we did, this, this relates specifically to patients, is we made a public blacklist. So it turns out that uh, Justin Zook at NIST and colleagues found that in about 80% of the human genome, you can call variants and use any bioinformatics tool you want. And usually the calls are fine. But in about 10% of the human genomes, the calls are crap. And, so, uh, and they're crap because of a lot of structural variants, uh, mappability, GC content, that kind of thing. So in collaboration with Fritz Sedlizek uh, and a couple other brilliant bioinformaticians, we made a public blacklist and found that it actually uh, overlapped quite well with the GRCH blacklist and the ENCODE blacklist. Uh, so this is really a blacklist for those doing clinical genetics to be careful about reporting SNPs in these regions of the human genome to patients. But what I'm really excited about is all of the stuff I just showed you, we built in hackathons. So these are people coming together for three nine-hour days building these things. So this is the future of bioinformatics built by volunteers. We can see all this stuff we never thought we could do. So let me show you a couple more examples of that. I already showed you this. Um, we can do novel virus discovery. So if we're interested in new viruses, uh, we can look. But what if they're in genomes, right? What if we have uh, viruses uh, that are lysogenic? So phages and bacteria uh, or endogenous retroviruses. So, uh, we built the most primitive De Bruyne graph ever. Uh, we chop off the ends of contigs, and then uh, anneal reads on, and then reassemble eventually. Uh, that's more for the bioinformaticians. Uh, this is now in Python. Uh, we can now categorize new virus families using this with an algorithm called Virus Friends. But here's the fun part. Uh, for those of you who are in research, this is osf.io. And what I'm able to do with this site is give the 40 or so people that worked on this project credit for it. So I can give them all credit. And uh, if there's a public, there will be a publication eventually. When there's a publication eventually, I can give them credit. And I can also cite the pieces of software that they're building. By the way, I didn't mention in these hackathons, we have teams that work on all different stuff. Nobody's competing. Everybody's working together. Um, usually there's four to eight teams working on uh, all different projects, 80% of teams build something successfully, and 10% of teams publish on that thing in a peer-reviewed manuscript. And that, to me, is exciting, because right now we communicate science at a speed much slower than a raft crossing the Pacific Ocean. I mean, really, it takes 18 months to publish our science uh, in a lot of cases. Here, we can publish in a couple of weeks, and so that's really nice. Another thing we built is an antibiotic resistance detection pipeline. This is, not the, uh, this is not the only antibiotic resistance detection pipeline. But what I'm really proud of, this is simple enough for undergraduates to use. So undergraduates, City University of New York, San Diego State, were able to use this to look for antibiotic resistance in metagenomes. So that's, those are things out there. Uh, here's another way to do that. This is that challenge that I mentioned before. We built other educational resources. So this one's a bit dated. I encourage nobody to use this. Um, but we used this in collaboration with a mini MOOC we built. Uh, and about 3,000 people uh, learned how to map RNA-seq using this tutorial that we built in a hackathon. 
Um, now we're doing a lot of education using Jupyter Notebooks. And really, in my mind, if you can use a Jupyter Notebook, you can do bioinformatics. But um, hold on, let me get back to Jupyter Notebooks, and then I'll, uh, I'll show you something else with Jupyter Notebooks later. Um, this is, uh, has anybody ever heard of Oxford Nanopore? Anybody? So Oxford Nanopore is a new sequencing technology where we get amazingly long reads. Instead of a 200 nucleotides, now we're getting you know, 20, reads of 20,000, 30,000. So, and these things are also really cheap, right? I mean, for $1,000, you can get the, actually they just give you the box for free now, and you just buy the disposable that goes in it for $1,000. You can go out uh, mushroom foraging, pick some mushrooms and sequence them. I'm not joking, I mean, people do this type of stuff now. Um, the really cool part about this is we built a pipeline and I said to the people that built this at UCSC, I said, you know, really, I want this pipeline to be simple enough for college students to use. They came back and they said, we think this is simple enough for high school students to use. And you can get a list of species. Say you take a cup of seawater, you can get a list of species in the sample and numbers of counts of genes um, in that sample. So really, what we're starting to talk about is a genomics reality where regular individuals, citizens can be involved. And that, to me, is really neat, particularly in the ecological sense. And if you were going to learn to map RNA-seq, this is what you should use. Check out seekacademy.org. Five years ago, it was uh, a task for professional bioinformaticians to line up RNA-seq data and epigenomics data. Now, anybody can do it. You go to seekacademy.org, learn how to do it. You can do bioinformatics. Uh, we collaborate with a lot of other packages, like Bioconductor. Uh, like NextFlow, and really, I, I keep saying to my friend Ben, Pearl in bioinformatics is so six years ago, and that's true, maybe four years ago. Six years ago, we were writing Bash Script, or people were writing Fortran, but now we have workflow pipelines, right? So we have workflow pipelines that automatically run stuff, and we can wrap this in a Jupyter notebook so anybody can run it. All you got to do is click the little triangles. I'll show you in a minute. Um, so, and this makes the bioinformatics pipelines reproducible. And that's a huge thing. It's not just somebody's script anymore. It's a containerized thing run by a workflow execution system so you can see the parameters and reproduce that science. So, uh, this is a more complicated uh, way of running, but we're collaborating with PacBio and Illumina and DNA Nexus uh, to put a very complex pipeline uh, in CWL. Uh, we're collaborating with Cedar on metadata. Um, and, and we've been able to do some relatively complicated things. So this is one of the most complicated things we've built. Uh, it is a Mendelian randomization pipeline. So if you have SNP X, are you more or less susceptible to something? This was built in collaboration uh, with Kaven at EPA. And uh, we're also uh, looking at... Um, expressed structural variants uh, in different types of cancer. And there are some melanoma patients that really seem uh, to have some structural variants that are expressed. Um, we're also collaborating uh, with NIAID. So this is a cross between dbGaP and TCGA, uh, as well as the Genomic Alliance, uh, or the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Um, this is David Steinberg. This is their slide. NCBI is a repository. Uh, and we're building graphs. So we, uh, we were the first people. We put seven graph genomes uh, into, or seven human genomes into a graph. Uh, and that work was done by, uh, mostly by Evan Bierstedt um, and Alex Dilthey. They're still working on it. Um, a lot of people like to talk about machine learning. I find that if I put randomly insert the words machine learning into any hackathon project, uh, 10 times as many people sign up for it. Uh, here's some actual real machine learning uh, that we did with uh, uh, XGBoost, where uh, here we're looking for contamination in plant genomes. And so it turns out that uh, um, with Magic Blast, you can find things if things are in the sort of uh, reference databases, but if they're not, you can take eight MERS uh, and uh, put them in 20 dimensional vectors. Um, and then you actually get similar sensitivity about 87 to 91%. So that's, that's a fun thing. Um, and we're, we're also interested in modular software. So I show this slide because 
Um, oh, by the way, there's a cool movie too. But I show this slide because I had some uh, colleagues from Northwestern come and they said, yeah, we really want to build an RNA-seq viewer. And I said, well, first just find out how many RNA-seq viewers are out there. They spent five minutes Googling and they said, we found 36. And I said, please don't build another RNA-seq viewer. Build a JavaScript module that can be put into other RNA-seq viewers. And they did that. So that was pretty cool. But now, I think we're moving beyond where anybody has to do mapping of RNA-seq uh, because we have a prototype. And, and this has actually been a multi-step process that was actually initiated many years ago by a guy named Ben Harrison, uh, where basically we have a prototype. You just put in the data set you want, uh, and it does the RNA-seq mapping for you and gives you counts for those genes. And you can visualize them and do lots of other things. So that's kind of nice. Um, we uh, were able to map plasmids in infectious bacteria. And this work has actually been very useful uh, for some uh, MRSA infections in Brooklyn. Um, so that's been quite nice. But this stuff I'm really excited about. So um, this work was done by a guy named Joseph Halstead, which is an incredibly common name. Uh, but anyway, what we're able to do is subset diseases by looking at associations of SNPs and uh, literature and come up with new subclasses of disease. You say, well, that's pretty cool. Like, so you have subclasses of disease that are defined by genetic etiology. But check this out. We just did this in Chicago a few weeks ago. Now you can look at RNA-seq and what genes are being expressed, make clusters based on that, and then uh, go to the literature, pull out uh, specific terms, uh, and then recluster. And this is something I'm really excited about, uh, that we can look at what people are expressing and establish a new subclass of disease um, in real time. And this is what people, this, these are actually expressed genes, uh, not just potentials. So uh, that's a pretty cool thing. Also, uh, there's a problem in bioinformatics and medical informatics where uh, basically uh, EMRs or electronic medical records don't really talk to the bioinformatics community. And a lot of that is because of egos. Clinical informaticians don't always talk to bioinformaticians. Um, so here's one thing we were able to do. Uh, we were able to pull out um, variants uh, out of an EMR uh, in JSON format and then put them through public databases and return them back to the EMRs. So somebody shows up, uh, they get a genetic test, uh, there's some variants of unknown significance, now you can run them through public databases and we can do that automatically. Uh, and we're, we're actually working on wrapping that into software containers uh, so that this, these uh, pipelines are reproducible and can work with a number of different electronic medical record systems. Um, I will talk about this just because it's cool. So uh, I have a buddy, um, his name is Brad, and he's a, he's a staff scientist at NIH, so uh, sort of the, the equivalent of an assistant professor type person. And what, what he does is he's very interested in when red blood cells explode because they're infected with malaria. So, but the problem is that if you hit them with a laser too soon, then um, you get laser damage and you're unable to see the things you want. So what Brad, Brad wanted, he said, well, can you show me a way where I can just have uh, a robot monitor light images and right before the cells are about to explode, uh, tell me to turn the laser on so I don't have to sit there and do this because it's expensive, right? So, and time zero is when the cells explode and by looking at changes in something called radial variance, we're able to tell Brad about 10 minutes before the cells explode that he should turn the laser on uh, and start uh, confocal imaging these red blood cells which are infected with malaria. So that's a cool thing. Uh, this is more sort of bioinformatic-y stuff. Uh, we can tell how good um, uh, particular genome assemblies are. That will probably be a big deal when we start uh, actually uh, assembling lots of human genomes de novo, which is coming soon because we have to do that uh, to build the graphs. Um, we're able um, to look at uh, basic evolution of viruses. Uh, Moamin is actually also a uh, pharmacologist, 
And uh, another thing he's working on that I think is amazingly cool is looking at human gut microbiome and what effect that has on orally taken drugs. It turns out that bacteria have a lot of enzymes which will affect the activity of estrogen-like compounds. So that's a big deal uh, for a lot of people in this room. Um, so we've also looked a lot at structural variants. I'm going to skip over that, uh, given the audience. Um, and right now, uh, Chow Chi Lu in my group uh, is working on actually building graphs of chickpea genomes. And we're collaborating with a chickpea breeding center in Cordoba, Spain. Uh, that's Jose Dia, uh, who, has, um, who has reads from chickpea, a lot of different chickpeas. And we're using this to be able to quickly assess drought resistance of chickpea. But that's not the real reason we're doing this. We're really doing this so then when patients show up with uh, low coverage genetic data five years from now, you can run them in a graph and we can tell you which haplotype bin they're in. So, but it's, it's interesting to me. So, so I gave this talk, a uh, similar talk, uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, at NCBI. Somebody said, well, are these things uh, really simple enough for uh, regular people, biologists, to use? And I said, this is Devante Thompson, who works in my group. He's an undergrad. He has no computer science experience. And here's the thing. He's not using these Jupyter notebooks. He's building them. And, and this is Google Collaboratory, where, which is basically just Google Docs for Jupyter notebooks. So you can pass these around, just like they're a Google Doc. And then you can run reasonably complicated bioinformatics workflows. Oh, by the way, if you check out Google Collaboratory, you can also connect to the Google Cloud Platform just like that. That's a fairly trivial thing to do. So now we're really starting to cook with gas in the 21st century, I think. Uh, that's a very exciting thing. And for the bioinformaticians in the room, here's a really complex thing. So you can run uh, common workflow language uh, or singularity containers uh, using these things. So if you can containerize software, then theoretically I can pass it to you like a Google Doc and you press play. Uh, whoops, I don't know what that did. There we go. Um, and this is the most irreverent thing uh, we have ever built. So uh, I can't even put this on the National Library of Medicine's blog, uh, although the head of the National Library of Medicine thought this was funny, I think. But uh, anyway, uh, this is called SRA Tinder. So not all data in public databases is good. Some of it is crappy. So we've generated a system where you can tell if it's crappy. And remember, I told you it was taxonomically organized before. So here you can see that this is uh, down to the family level. This can only resolve bacteria, but it's really just because the reads are crappy. Uh, and so uh, you can eliminate ugly data sets. Um, finally, uh, you can view SNPs on structure. A lot of pharmacologists want to do that. And we're also really interested in working with other people's hackathons. And one project I'm really excited about, we've been working with Silicon Valley Artificial Intelligence, working on patient-specific hackathons. So patients show up with their data. We mix it with public data uh, and try to learn things about their particular, in most cases, cancer. Uh, so that's, that's a fun thing. Here's something that came out of one of those cancer hackathons. Um, and like I said, we're able to publish about 10% of these things in papers. Now we're starting to write blog posts, too. Uh, so thinking about different ways of scientific communication. Uh, if you're interested, check this out, bio biohackathons.github.io. Uh, this is a worldwide site of biomedical hackathons. So not all of them are as technically complex as this. For example, MedHacks at Johns Hopkins is for undergrads uh, interested in the biomedical space. Um, Hackathoners are in incredibly resilient. Uh, this is not much snow to you, I'm sure, but um, it was enough to close NIH. If you've ever been to DC, you know why. We were just talking about the red line catching on fire because of snow. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is a bunch of hackathoners walking down the street from this hotel where we were working in the lobby uh, to finish some projects, some really amazing projects, actually, some of the ones I showed you. Uh, People come and work in my group for four to six weeks as visiting bioinformaticians. That's an exciting thing. They do things like uh, find express structural variants in AML and not other diseases. To wrap this up, I like to, when I 
go out and speak uh, to groups of people uh, around the country. I like to talk about free stuff uh, that you can use. So, number one, if you're teaching bioinformatics, uh, check out uh, the NCBI webinars page because there are materials there and those are all public domain. So if you're, if you're teaching stuff having to do with NCBI, let us make your slides for you. Why remake your slides? Uh, also, uh, this is Biostar. If you need to know how to do stuff in bioinformatics, check out Biostar's. Uh, it's not really an endorsement, but it is. Um, and then also, there's this new product that uh, uh, was made by Istvan Albert, uh, who writes this, called the Biostar Handbook. The concept is, it's a textbook of bioinformatics, and it costs 20 bucks for a lifetime subscription. That is not an endorsement, because there is money involved, but uh, might be something fun to check out. Um, if, if, you've, uh, if this has piqued your interest at all, uh, I think it's probably worth your time to check out Software Carpentry. And for those of you involved in the academic administration here, uh, you can get Software Carpentry instructors to come to your institution and teach these two-day workshops. Uh, and really, they will get people up to speed with Linux and a bunch of these types of things. Galaxy is awesome. If you just want to learn how to do basic genomics, check out usegalaxy.org. Uh, if you are a bioinformatics researcher, I should have mentioned this to Ben's lab earlier, you can get free credits uh, from the NSF cloud. That's called Jetstream. So you can do uh, research in bioinformatics. And uh, NCI, the National Cancer Institute, also gives away free cloud time, as well as the major cloud providers. They all have research and education links. If you want free cloud time, you can get it usually these days. Uh, that's where our hackathons are. Uh, this was a hackathon at UCSC. For any of you who are involved in the bioinformatics community, you know there are sort of three big places uh, these days, um, and, and DDBJ in Japan. But one is UCSC, one is EBI, and one is NCBI. So here's a sign uh, with some people going to the NCBI UCSC hackathon. And this is the head of uh, EBI retweeting that picture. Uh, and so for 10 minutes, uh, the bioinformatics community of the world uh, was united. Um, and with that, uh, I think I'll stop and uh, take any questions you may have. I sincerely hope nobody raised their hand at 20 minutes, by the way, and said they were having a bad time. So I assume that means you all loved the presentation. But uh, hopefully this inspired you to think about uh, the way that bioinformatics and data science can play in your life. And uh, if I never see you again, uh, have a fantastic life. Good luck with everything. Uh, and if you uh, want to talk about data science, biological data science type stuff, uh, feel free to email me. I'm pretty easy to find on the internet. Uh, that's it. Uh, I guess I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you, Ben. So I had a quick question. So, I, I, well, it may not be a quick one, or the answer may not be. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, um, thinking about clinicians specifically, um, so I, I often wonder if the by the time the clinician has graduated, or a lot of this stuff is going to have moved on. So I try and focus on on the fundamentals of of the some of these concepts, so that they can take those with them. Um, but I still think it's really fascinating to think about how, how the clinician's life is going to change in, uh, say, say five years' time or so. So um, I, I'm wondering, like, what advice would you give to, like, be the absolute fundamental um, things, concepts that they should learn to take with them um, so that they'll be able to deal with the clinic in, 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 a, in, a, in the 21st century? So, so, so here's the deal. I mean, I, I think a lot about uh, education of this type of stuff. And it's very important for clinicians, I think, to have a fundamental understanding of genetics, right? Because at some point, somebody's going to have to explain to them that they have a structural variation on uh, one strand of their DNA. So structural variation is actually anything bigger than 50 nucleotides, sometimes thousands or millions of base pairs. So they have a deletion on one strand and uh, some other variant on the other strand, right? 
And, and that's important. But I think in terms of education, um, we, we don't have to go to the whiteboard and draw out these, these sorts of things. We can use computational tools in education. And what I mean is we can have medical students actually doing bioinformatics work, right? On their phones uh, or on their laptops uh, and really immersing themselves into it. And, and I think what's, what's important for that is I think being somewhat immersed in, in some of this, if we can have easy to use bioinformatics modules, I think being immersed and being able to see these things in genomics visualizations like, like Galaxy really uh, helps folks remember things uh, for years to come after they've gone through their third and fourth year and, and internship and residency. And so, so that's, I, I think that in my personal opinion, you know, I mean, seeing things visually is, and, and being able to interact with them in a computational sense is, is really fundamental to learning. Yeah. So as future clinicians, we're really going to be interested in the penetrance of a particular genotype and figuring out, is this actually going to affect my patient? Uh, and you know, we don't want to necessarily be alarmist if you have a certain allele that's associated with a bad phenotype, but then actually the patient isn't going to express that. So how is um, bioinformatics going to help us figure out when we need to be concerned about particular alleles or um, SNPs? That was a fantastic question. I promise you, audience, I did not feed him that question. But uh, it, it's great. So, so the way we're going to know about the penetrance of different alleles is to understand things about other SNPs in the genome, particularly haplotypes, uh, those haplotypes and the way haplotypes interact. So that's, that's a really big one, right? Because alleles do not interact uh, in isolation. And then the second thing is to understand how environmental factors interact with those SNPs, right? And so this whole Mendelian randomization thing, that's one way to understand, but also thinking about uh, RNA-seq as well as uh, epigenomic data, uh, interact with those SNPs so we can get an idea of much, we're never going to have a perfect idea of penetrance, right? Because that would be predicting the future and sort of Gattaca-ish and all that. Uh, so, uh, and I don't, don't want to dive too deep into ethical issues, but what I would say is uh, right now we're using these tools exactly to understand, to get really a better idea of the penetrance of certain alleles given their genomic and environmental context. So I wanted to add to that. We're an osteopathic school here. So we like to think about things uh, in a holistic in a holistic way. So I think there's some very interesting overlap between thinking about things in, in this kind of a way and, and, and osteopathic philosophy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So my question was about the volume of data. Uh, as we uh, make new experimental types, data gathering types, images, sequences, et cetera, et cetera, and, and especially at a growing pace, uh, what's NCBI doing about um, archiving access, is housing this information and making it publicly available, including upload and download. That's, that's going to become an issue. Uh, great question. So uh, remember I showed you Magic Blast and maybe a dozen pieces of software that are based on Magic Blast. All of those things operate through streaming, right? So they're not copying data you don't want. And they're only getting a... Uh, derivative data from that. So, so think about a paradigm instead of copying a fast queue, right? And then mapping it and making a BAM file and then sorting the BAM and then making an index BAM where you've already made four copies of the data. What if you just streamed it directly to a BAM file, right? And then, and then from that, you make a VCF, right? And with these workflow execution systems, 
then you don't have to keep any of that. You just go from, you go from raw reads to VCF, way smaller, right? Second thing is not moving data. So large data sets, we're already not housing. They're either being housed on the cloud by the institutes themselves, um, or uh, they are, or we're housing them in the cloud, right? Or, and we're moving towards that paradigm. So the idea is not making copies of the data sets and keeping them in situ. So, so that the data really, we don't want to move and copy data. The idea is for us to have an index to show you where to go to get the data, and it should be seamless just like we're housing it locally. And that is where we are moving uh, at this point. It was a great question. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm not a medical student. I'm in the security community, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about Docker, because Docker is a huge tool um, in the cybersecurity field. So I just wondered if you could just tell a little bit more about how what the relationship is with using that as a tool. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, I thought you were actually going to ask me about uh, dbGaP. Uh, so it's really nice that you asked me about Docker. Um, anyway, so so a lot of science is unreproducible, right? For those of you who are sort of new to this game, uh, you go to a methods section, you want to recapitulate somebody's analysis, and they said, they say something like, we use custom scripts to generate this data, right? In fact, next month I'm piloting um, a workshop on research reproducibility with the National Library of Medicine, where we're going to go through uh, about 15 bioinformatics papers and reproduce them. So that said, that is a pain to do. But with Docker, we can make that work reasonably seamlessly. So what, uh, there's a big cancer uh, research institute in Toronto. And they were sequencing people all over Canada and in Europe. And there were a couple of sites in the United States. It's called ICGC. And what they needed to be able to do was to be able to run the bioinformatics the same in every single site. So what they were able to do was package all of that software into what is called a Docker container. Now, what is a Docker container? A Docker container is basically more or less a VM where you can put in all the dependencies, all the software you want, the operating system, all that, and package it up. And then the person on the other end can actually run their analysis in that container. So if you have seven cancer centers across the world and you want to isolate that variable and have them all do bioinformatics the same way, you probably want a Docker container. And realistically, and, and we're moving from that actually with one container to these complex bioinformatics workflows where we have a string of containers and a workflow execution system uh, calling multiple containers. Um, and then we're also able to have provenance on the different parameters that people use uh, for various things. Yeah. So thank you for asking that question. Does anybody not understand at this point what a Docker container is? Good. All right. So nobody's admitting that they don't understand what a Docker container is. That's totally fine. But uh, no, I mean, think about if, if I said, OK, well, here's like I want uh, I want an iPhone operating, you can't actually do this because these things are proprietary, but if I wanted an iPhone uh, operating system, theoretically I could package it up and put it on my Android, right? Um, so, so, and I could do that with something like Docker. So that is an oversimplistic explanation. Any other questions? So again, hopefully this, uh, this has sparked uh, some interest in the subject. And uh, at least hopefully you got lunch. Hopefully there's nobody that both didn't get lunch and enjoy the talk. So uh, anyway, I think Ben had some closing remarks. And then <laughs> you were reaching for the microphone a minute ago. I think it might, I think it might just be a, a tick that I have to reach for the microphone. No, sorry. Um, I did actually have another question, though. Oh, OK, yeah. I mean, so yeah. you uh, explain to me how you can visualize 150,000 genomes So in yeah. one as a graph. Because you, you talk about using tools to, to teach 
the, um, the med students, right? And so I like to use a, a genome browser where the genome itself is just one long linear line. And then I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the concept of splice variants and that's kind of enough, right? That's enough. Then you've got like five, six, seven, eight lines on there. So does that mean, I know, so I know the answer to this, but hopefully that doesn't mean that we're going to have to look at 150,000 lines on the genome browser at once. How is that information represented? Uh, so that was not a nice and easy question. Uh, and I may need a computer to answer it. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Yeah. Um, uh, AV person, I can use the internet, right? That's cool. All right, great. Thank you to the AV person. Let's see if I can just. So, the most uh, likely way a lot of these things will be shown is uh, something, some variation of this subway map. Um, so I think that's that's sort of. Uh, where most people are thinking what these things are going to look like. But, but here's the deal, right? So, so here's a graph genome uh, subway map, and it shows relationships of different haplotypes to each other. But you're going to get stacks of haplotypes. But the bigger thing is people aren't snowflakes in that sense, right? People tend to show ha share haplotypes. Why? Because we know people are descended from each other. So uh, they share uh, various haplotypes, and so you're not going to get 150,000 haplotypes at each stack. You're going to get the most common haplotypes. And that's actually a big thing, is you're probably going to look at the most common haplotypes first, right? And then, because most people will actually fit into those bins. And then other people will be in rarer haplotypes, which you would have to zoom in to see uh, or set some parameter. Also, uh, this is something that I'm particularly excited about. If you have so say you have this sort of thing, and, and you're looking, you're interested in breast cancer, right? And, and say you have a, a variant that we know is penetrant, right? A, a missense variant or some sort of deletion in BRCA1 or BRCA2, right? Well, then we can, look, we can look for those things here. We can look for those particular haplotypes, those disease-causing haplotypes. And if we find them, we can stop with that genome, right? And set it aside and say, we found that duck. We don't have to look for that haplotype anymore because we have you have the haplotype and you have the phenotype, so you're pretty much there, right? I mean, there, there obviously there's some gray area and some corner cases there, but basically I think that's uh, that is the general idea. Did I answer your question? Uh, good. I, he seems convinced. I, I hope the rest of you are too. Okay. Thank you, Ben. That's been awesome. Thanks. <laughs>